The Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense presents Germ Warfare, a very graphic history, written by Max Brooks, narrated by James Lewis, with special guest performance by Erica Lewis, copyright 2019. They are everywhere, in the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe. They cannot be seen with the naked eye. They are the microbes, the bacteria, the viruses. And while most are harmless or even helpful, the dangerous ones have killed or crippled more human beings than all the wars in history. For most of human history, we had no idea where diseases came from or that microbes even existed. So cures ranged from utterly useless to absurdly harmful. Bleeding, leeches, drilling holes in the head to hysterically murderous. Some say that the mass slaughter of cats in pre-modern Europe may have led to an increase of the rat population, which in turn help spread plague-infected fleas. Bring out your dead! Cats come from the devil. They bring the plague. So do gypsies and Jews. Kill them all. Even when humans discovered the microscopic world, Antony Van Leeuwenhoek, these animacules are living on my teeth. Humans might not have known what caused disease, but they knew how deadly they could be. <coughs> Prey and fiction doesn't set in. It kills more of our soldiers than the enemy. Animacules, an early term for microscopic life. That is why Scythian archers dip their arrows in a mixture of blood and horse dung to make sure everyone they shot <laughs> became infected. Why in 1346, Mongol warriors catapulted plague-infected corpses over the walls of the Genoese city of Kaffa. Why in 1763, during the siege of Fort Pitt, British garrison commander William Trent gave a peace delegation of Delaware Native Americans two blankets and a handkerchief out of the smallpox hospital to convey smallpox to the Indians. It is unknown how effective this biological attack was because the Delaware Indians were already suffering the ravages of European smallpox. Why in 1864, during the American Civil War, Confederate sympathizer Dr. Luke Pryor Blackburn volunteered at a yellow fever treatment hospital in Bermuda. From the journal of William Trent, invoice to the Crown, August 1763. Testimony of Dr. Blackburn's agent, Godfrey Joseph Hyams. So he could steal the infected clothing, smuggle them back to the U.S., and sell them at auction to destroy the army and everyone in the country. Fortunately, the trunks were never opened and the public was never exposed. By the 19th century, the medical and public health communities began to get their act together. Revolutionary steps forward were made by Ignaz Semmelweis. Wash your hands. Sir Joseph Lister. Carbolic acid disinfects both the wound and the surgical instruments. Dr. Louis Pasteur. It's called a vaccine, and it will help the body build up a resistance to the disease. And women like Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. Dorothea Dix, Clara Barton, Dr. Mary Walker, and the army of nurses who served in the American Civil War. 
You can't dig your toilets right next to the creek you drink from? Really? Why? But while science helped win the war on germs, it also helped use germs for war. World War I, 1914 to 1918, saw the widespread use of submarines, airplanes, machine guns, poisonous gas, and germs. Many countries experimented with microbes, including Imperial Germany. Unlike previous guesswork, it was based on hard science, using fact-based research to grow weaponized bacteria. Pseudomonas malii, anthrax. Horses were the primary target of the attacks because most of the world's armies depended on them for transportation. During the war, Germany embarked on a global campaign of biological sabotage, attempting to infect animal populations in Finland, which was still part of Russia, France, Argentina, and the USA. German saboteurs even set up their own biological weapons plant in the basement of a home in Silver Spring, Maryland. Finished? Almost. While it's hard to know how effective this program really was, it scared the world's leaders into including germs in the 1925 protocol for the prohibition of the use in asphyxiating, poisonous, or other gases and of bacteriological methods of warfare. Not all nations ratified the Geneva Protocol at the time, including the rising power of Imperial Japan. Under the leadership of General Shiro Ishii, Japan conducted the largest, most lethal germ warfare campaign the world has ever seen. Ironically, Ishii was inspired by the Geneva Protocol. He reasoned, that if the rest of the world wanted to ban germ weapons, they must have serious potential. And so he set about building a massive biological weapons program with the largest plant in the Ping Fan district of the occupied puppet state of Manchukuo. Picking up where the Germans left off, the Japanese successfully grew an entire arsenal of deadly microbes, smallpox, anthrax, glanders, tularemia, tuberculosis, tick encephalitis, gas gangrene, brucellosis, tetanus, botulism, salmonella, cholera, typhoid, typhus, and bubonic plague. Like their Nazi allies halfway across the world, the Japanese used human beings as live test subjects. While most of the victims were Chinese civilians, they also experimented on British, Australian, and American POWs. The estimated number of live victims ranges between 3,000 and tens of thousands. During the war, the Japanese unleashed their bioweapons against the Soviet Union and China, pouring infected slurry into rivers, spraying rice paddies, giving out infected cakes, giving prisoners infected food, then releasing them in the hopes that they'd infect their families. They also directly infected prisoners, then sent them across the border in the hopes that they'd infect the Russians. Aircraft dropped food packages infested with plague-carrying fleas, or porcelain bombs packed with infected fleas, or tiny black particles containing concentrated plague. It is hard to know exactly how many people were murdered by Japanese biological weapons. Accounts range from tens of thousands to one Chinese study placing the dead at roughly 740,000. Regardless of the exact number, Two undeniable facts emerged from these crimes against humanity. First, Chinese areas with stronger public health systems were better able to withstand the germ attacks. Second, 
the world finally woke up to the fact that microbes could be used in weapons of mass destruction. While the Cold War is largely seen through the lens of a nuclear arms race, a second biological arms race was waged in secret. In the US and Soviet Union, as well as many other nations, various bacteria and viruses were grown, tested, and turned into weapons of war. Viruses in particular became the most attractive germ weapon because they are smaller than bacteria and can sneak into human cells before our immune system detects them and are immune to antibiotics, the new wonder drug of the early 20th century. Test came back positive for E. coli. Nothing a little penicillin can. She hasn't had her polio shot. Dear God. Because antibiotics won't stop a virus, the only sure defense is to prevent initial infection with a vaccine. Vaccines, along with well-funded labs, healthcare, education, and all the other elements of a strong public health system, did so much more to protect us from a germ war. Is this really gonna protect us from an atom bomb? Than anyone could have done about a nuclear war. That is because unlike nuclear or conventional war, we didn't have to choose between spending money on peace or war when confronting germs. In the case of a germ attack, what kept us healthy also kept us safe. Regardless of how safe Americans might have been, the spread of germ warfare programs among other nations increased the chance of a global pandemic. Statement on Chemical and Biological Defense Policies and Programs on November 25th in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. On November 25th, 1969, President Richard M. Nixon announced the end of the U.S. Offensive Biological Weapons Program. The United States shall renounce the use of lethal biological agents and weapons and all other methods of biological warfare. In 1972, the U.S., the Soviet Union, and over 100 other countries signed the Biological Weapons Convention, which banned the development, production, and stockpiling of these weapons of mass destruction. The Convention on the Prohibition of the Development, Production, and Stockpiling of Bacteriological, Biological, and Toxin Weapons, and on their destruction, banned the development, stockpiling, acquisition, transfer, retention, assistance with, and production of biological agents, weapons, equipment, and delivery systems. Some doubted the Soviet Union's commitment to the treaty, and history would prove them right. In late 1979, rumors began leaking out of the USSR about an anthrax epidemic in and around the city of Servlosk. While Western intelligence sources suspected an accident at the Servlosk bioweapons plant, the Soviet government blamed the outbreak on tainted meat. But the rumors continued to flow out of Servlosk, along with smuggled photos of military checkpoints and decontamination trucks around the facility. May 27th, 1992. Interview with Komsomolskaya. Pravda. Russian President Boris Yeltsin finally admitted the truth in a 1992 interview. Our military development was the cause. The full details of the release of anthrax into the environment have yet to be fully disclosed. And while Russia refuses to let the U.S. into some of their biological research facilities, insisting the way the U.S. does, that their biological program is purely defensive. The greatest threat may not come from Russia, China, or any other country that may or may not be working with biological weapons. At present, 16 countries have yet to sign or ratify the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, BWC, while some who have, such as North Korea, are suspected of continuing secret biological warfare programs. Today, the greatest danger may come from so-called non-state actors, more commonly known as terrorists. 
while rogue individuals and groups always want to get their hands on a nuclear weapon, a biological weapon is much more attractive. That is because uranium, the fuel for a nuclear bomb, can only be mined in 20 countries, while microbes exist everywhere on Earth. Also, unlike uranium ore, which is incredibly expensive and difficult to process, finished almost. Microbes can be brewed cheaply at home. To date, there have been only two successful bioterrorist attacks on American soil. Ready. The first was carried out in 1984 by the Saniacin cult in Wasco County, Oregon, developed by Ma Anand, Nurse Mangala Puja, who spearheaded the cult's bioweapons program. And on her orders as the cult's second-in-command, Ma Anand Sheila, Rajnishi cultists, infected several restaurants in Wasco County with salmonella. The goal was to sicken enough people to keep them from voting in a local election. Because none of the victims died, because officials were afraid that publicity would lead to copycat attacks, and because the attacks took place a decade and a half before September 11, the Rajnishis were charged as criminals, not terrorists. Most of the conspirators were given light sentences, while Rajnish himself, whom to his death pleaded innocence, was simply asked to leave the United States. In 2001, one week after the September 11th Al-Qaeda attacks, envelopes containing what appeared to be military-grade anthrax were mailed to several locations across the U.S. 9-11-01, you cannot stop us. We have this anthrax. You die now. Death to America. Death to Israel. Allah is great. Targets included members of Congress and news media. 22 people were sickened in the attacks. Of these, five people, including two postal workers, were killed. The FBI Amerithrax investigation eventually led to Dr. Bruce Edwards Ivins, an American microbiologist working for the U.S. Army at Fort Detrick. Before Ivins could be officially charged, he committed suicide in 2008. While the investigation took nearly a decade to conclude, the immediate public panic rippled across America. As former White House Press Secretary Scott McClellan stated in his memoir, I know President Bush's thinking was deeply affected by the anthrax attacks. He was determined not to let another terrorist attack happen on his watch and to challenge regimes believed to be seeking weapons of mass destruction. Critics of President Bush charge that the bioterrorist threat was used to manipulate the American people into supporting the Iraq war, while his defenders claim that intelligence reports assessed that Saddam Hussein had biological weapons of mass destruction. Regardless, no biological or chemical or nuclear weapons were ever found by U.S. forces or United Nations inspectors in Iraq. And the perception of crying wolf damages the public trust to this day. While Saddam Hussein may not have had biological weapons, others continue to develop them. Today, globalization has empowered the modern bioterrorist. Online information is readily accessible as is lab equipment, which can be ordered from anywhere in the world with just one click. Finished? Almost. Fortunately, we can be better prepared. Mommy, it, it hurts. Just for a second, and then you'll never have to worry again. Employees must wash hands. Cover your mouth when you cough. This meat, U.S. inspected and passed by Department of Agriculture. This restaurant, sanitary inspection grade A. Grade A pasteurized milk. U.S. food inspectors. And 
wastewater treatment. Just like in the Cold War biological arms race, what keeps us healthy can also keep us safe. We've had confirmed Zika cases in this area, so please get tested if you're thinking of getting pregnant. But we can and should do more. Biodetection Sniffer United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases USAMRID Fort Detrick, Maryland Definite genetic manipulation Local hospital The lab reports just came back Central Intelligence Agency We picked up terrorist chatter about a potential biological attack along the lines you're describing Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC Atlanta, Georgia. It's similar to the Eurasian strain. With some mutations. With increased investment in biological detection technology, enhanced communication between public health and national security organizations, leadership and coordination by a single high-level official in the White House, increased congressional oversight, and greater, more effective public outreach, we can stay one step ahead of biological disaster. The White House, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor. We now have a confirmed biological attack. Secretary of Homeland Security. We need to get someone on TV ASAP to make an announcement to the American people. Secretary of State. I will request an emergency meeting at the UN immediately. Attorney General, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of Health and Human Services, The private sector can ramp up vaccine and protective gear production within the hour. Homeland Security Advisor. Vice President of the United States. Let's just hope they listen. Unfortunately, the terrorist's greatest ally is us. The problem today is that public health has become a victim of its own success in many countries. At the turn of the last century, infectious diseases were the number one killers of people in the industrialized world. Now, they don't even rank in the top five. Yeah, it looks like it's just cold. She should be back at school next week. Most people today take public health for granted. Fake news. No medical tyranny. And some don't even see why we need it anymore. From the left. The government's growing wolf again, just like Iraq! Center. I heard from someone who heard from somebody who read somewhere on the internet that vaccines are bad. Right. I'm not going to pay any more taxes because government isn't the solution to our problem. The government is the problem. Conspiracy theories, budget cuts, and personal apathy threatened to erode all the progress humanity has made. No mandatory vaccinations. Anti-vaxxer clusters. CDC budget cuts. (laughs) Thank you. And leave us vulnerable to a biological attack. Germs will always be with us. And we must always be ready. Most the France. Test us the villages and vanots. Yes, ma'am. We stopped the spread. But if we accept the cost in time and money, we'll never have to pay the cost in lives. You've been listening to Germ Warfare, a very graphic history. Written by Max Brooks. Narrated by James Lewis. With special guest performance by Erica Lewis. Audio adaption, directed, and produced by James Lewis at Talktime Studios. Executive producer, the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. The Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense was established in 2014 to comprehensively assess U.S. biodefense efforts 
and issue recommendations to foster change. The Commission's 2015 report, a national blueprint for biodefense, leadership and major reform needed to optimize efforts, identified capability gaps, and recommended changes to U.S. policy and law to strengthen national biodefense while optimizing resource investments. Former Senator Joe Lieberman and former Governor Tom Ridge co-chair the commission and are joined by former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, former Representative Jim Greenwood, former Homeland Security Advisor Ken Weinstein, and former Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor Lisa Monaco. Hudson Institute is the commission's fiscal sponsor.